In the last video, we were talking about three different ideas for the size of the universe. Again, the key thing to focus on here is that these ideas for the size of the universe came based on our understanding of the laws of physics. What I'm going to show you then is hopefully going to blow your mind. These are wrong. Um, all three of them, actually. So this is actually something a little bit weird. And keep in mind, on an exam, you still have to say these. Okay, so this right here is what you're supposed to talk about for an IB exam. I'm hoping that um, the new syllabus that hopefully comes out soon will be addressing this because it turns out uh, two groups of cosmologists have actually figured out that there's something else going on here. So keep in mind, on an exam, do this. But what I want to show you is this. Two teams of cosmologists who are doing the same stuff. So just to show you this right here. So these are here were the three ideas for the universe. They figured out this. I'm going to maybe put this as a different color here. So they figured out that the universe seems to be doing something like this. So what this means is that if this is now, you know, somewhere over here, I'm not sure where that is, but earlier it seems like the universe has indeed been uh, slowing down its expansion. So what that would mean then, or what that would represent, is that gravity was still winning at some point. But what's really important and so cool is that these guys figured out that at, at some time, a few billion years ago, it seems like something else took over and has been winning ever since. And that thing that's been winning is making the universe expand at an expanding and increasing rate. Remember I explained though that all three of these ideas here make perfect sense if you assume that all mass has to attract all mass. And up until uh, not very long, this was always thought to be correct. But what's really cool then is there were two different teams of cosmologists. And what they were doing, um, they were separately, uh, so they weren't really exactly working together, not in a strictest sense. But what they were doing is they were looking at supernovas in galaxies. So they would look at this big explosion when a star ends its life and that supernova of a certain type, okay, if it's, uh, so there's a very special type of supernova and it seems to have a steady and stable maximum intensity. So that means that if, if all supernovas of that type seem to have the same maximum intensity, then that can be used as a standard candle. Remember, what that means then is that um, if we see one then of a, one of these types of supernovas that looks dimmer, we know that it's further. And if we see one that looks brighter, we know it's closer. So this allowed them to map the distance to galaxies with uh, you know, precision that had never before been done. And both of these teams, independently of each other, figured out this, that the universe now, at the moment, seems to be increasing at an increasing rate which means our three ideas here are limited. I'm not going to say they're totally wrong and useless because they're not, because of course they still use our ideas of physics as we know it, but what seems to be happening now for whatever reason, the universe is doing this. It's increasing at an increasing rate. And trust me, when the scientists figured out, they were like, what the? Um, and actually these uh, two teams of scientists, there was actually three of them, three of the specific scientists from these two teams were just uh, given the Nobel Prize in Physics um, in 2011. So this is uh, very new. This is very new stuff. So they were just given it uh, just in the new year or the past year. Or in, I'm recording this in 2012 at least. But uh, these scientists were actually given the Nobel Prize in Physics just for discovering that this right here happens. Now does that mean that anybody knows what's causing this? Nope, not at the moment. In fact, if you could figure that out, you would for sure get the Nobel Prize. I mean, just think, teams of scientists, they won the Nobel Prize just for figuring this out, just, just getting the evidence that the universe does this. They don't know why. So this has actually started a whole new field of physics. So this is actually something within astrophysics. It's called, uh, well, this is people who study something called dark matter which is something a little bit different. And there's also people studying this stuff, which they call dark energy. Now they couldn't call it matter. This is the key thing. There's actually a difference. If something is dark matter, 
What that means is, uh, well, we can't see it, but it has mass as we understand it. You know, mass attracts mass, they attract. So dark matter still does that, it still behaves properly. Even if we can't see it, it could be like an asteroid floating out in the middle of nowhere, or a big giant rock that's just not giving off light. It still exists, we just can't see it. So that's dark matter. There are various more exotic forms of dark matter that are uh, predicted and expected, but uh, we won't go into that right now. But it turns out this is a whole other field, and they can't call it dark matter because this stuff, whatever's, whatever it's happening, is not acting like regular matter does. It's not making it curve down. So they, well, they can't see it, so they say dark something. And they call it energy because, well, it's something that still has to have an energy and has to apply a force on the universe. Uh, so they call it dark energy. And again, that's because they can't call it dark matter because matter attracts. See, this dark energy, whatever this is, is making the universe do something totally opposite. I mean, this, this means that there's some force out there, there's something causing things to go opposite to what gravity does. It's acting opposite to what matter does. So to call it antimatter is maybe a bit limited because it's much more than that. To call it anti-gravity is somewhat correct, but again, a bit limited. So they call it dark energy. And believe me, there's lots of teams of scientists all over the world that are working really hard to try to figure out what could this stuff possibly be? And why is it doing this? And can we figure something out from this? So I think this is really fascinating stuff. The fact that our understanding of the universe is based on our current observations. And when our observations demand that we change our ideas of the universe, Hopefully, as humans, we can accept it. And in this case, they have. They call it dark energy, and away they go. They study it. So where I just uh, have been studying at uh, the Niels Bohr Institute here in Copenhagen, where I'm, uh, well, I'm filming this in Copenhagen. So um, I've done my studies for the last few years at the Dark Cosmology Center. And this is precisely what they're looking at. Some of them are looking at dark matter. Some are looking at dark energy. And they're trying to figure out what's going on. How cool is that? So the whole new branch of physics has sort of opened up. So does that mean that this stuff is totally useless? No, not at all. This just shows that at, in the past, they used to think that density equaled destiny. In other words, if you only knew the density of the universe, then you could figure out what's going to happen. Now it turns out, still, the density of the universe is still important, but it's not the only thing. See, there's, it's almost like, you know, before they thought there was only one knob to turn, you know, in the universe. Let's say you just, you know, make the density bigger or smaller, and then you could see what's going to happen. Now it turns out there is at least one other knob. So there's not only density, but there's also this, uh, we actually call it lambda. So some sort of dark energy contribution. And it turns out in the past it was weaker. Now it seems to be winning. So somehow it's taken over. So it just shows us that our understanding of the universe Although this was nice and admirable, it's not entirely complete. So now we have to include something else called dark energy. So on a test, do you have to write about that? Nope. Leave that out of there. So just, if you're asked on an exam about dark, uh, no, not about dark anything, but about the universe and the density and open, closed, or flat, definitely give them this. I just want you to know that it's not entirely complete. And now we actually know the universe is doing something way weirder than we ever thought. And things are happening that we totally don't understand. I think that's really cool, isn't it? That there's a whole new branch of science that just grew up because of some results. So this is the end of the SL portion of the astrophysics. If you're SL, I've included the HL videos which are coming up just because you might find them interesting. If you're a higher level student, you have to continue on with the next topic. So we're going to talk about a little bit more about cosmology and also about nucleosynthesis, about what goes on inside stars and also how we can actually estimate this age of the universe based on something called Hubble's Law and a Hubble diagram.